Welcome to Biology 2402 Lecture Series, Chapter 21 on Blood Vessels and Circulation. In this chapter, we are going to extend our understanding of Chapters 20 and a little bit of Chapter 19. In Chapter 20 on the heart, we learned the heart's main function is to get the blood out of the heart, and it's going to be assisted by way of blood vessels. If you recall, one of the last things we talked about in chapter 20 on the heart was afterload. And afterload is because of the poor blood circulation leaving the heart. So if the aorta does not do a good job at removing the blood away from the heart, right on top of the aortic valve, then we're going to have a higher afterload, which in turn responds by having a lower stroke volume, so the heart would have to pump harder to get blood around. Now we're going to continue with that thought. So in chapter 21, we're going to start with this slide. So this is your first slide for chapter 21. Now there's really not much I can say about this slide, so we're going to move to the next one. Now this slide I did talk about before. I mentioned AACVV when we started chapter 20 on the heart. And AACVV refers to the first A of artery, second A arteriole, then C for capillary, first V for venule, and the second V for veins. Now what were the two main veins that lead back to the right atrium? They were, of course, the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava. And when it came to blood away from the heart, we learned that we have the pulmonary arteries that take blood away from the heart towards the lungs. So we're going to see that again a little bit. Now in this chapter, the key language is going to be this word right here, arterioles. So the arterioles are going to play the greatest role now. Now, when we, when we talk about arterioles, we're talking about blood vessels that have the innate ability to respond electrically and chemically. Again, the usual Nemesis 95% rule theme of electrical and chemical. Now, the reason why arterioles are unique is that they have the ability to have elastic fibers, which will help stretch the blood vessel and help it recoil and push the blood forward. Likewise, they have smooth muscles that are electrically and chemically stimulated. Next slide. On this slide, we talked about those very same things. So last time we talked about the aorta, which was the main vessel leaving from the left ventricle in essence, leading to the systemic circulation of AACVV. And we also talked about the blood leaving the heart going to the pulmonary area by way of pulmonary trunk. Next slide. Now we have our capillaries, and we did mention that the diameter of a capillary is roughly that of a red blood cell, forcing red blood cells to move in a single file. We also talked about the chemical gas diffusion that will occur between the oxygen and the carbon dioxide within the capillaries. Keep in mind that capillaries are almost always found near cells. So the distance between any cell and a capillary is very small. Next slide. Now this slide mentions the three layers of the blood vessel wall. The tunica intima, the tunica media, and the tunica externa. Now although this slide is important because it mentions the layers of these three, the next few slides are the ones that give you the properties of these three layers. So it's nice to know the three layers, but it's also more important to know the properties of them. So I'm going to go line by line, slide by slide, explaining that. Now, in chapter 21, there is page 709. Now, page 709 is a vital page. It has two pictures at the top, one showing you the artery, one showing you the vein, and there's a chart below it. That picture and that chart is vital to your understanding. Now let's continue on the slides. Next we have the tunica intima. Notice it is the inner lining. And of course, inner lining, like you learned in 2401, if it's a lining, we know we're dealing with 
epithelial and hence the fancy name of endothelial. So endothelial lining is really made out of epithelial cells. Then the next layer, sort of outward, as you learned in 2401, we have epithelial cells, a little thin basement membrane, and then right after the basement membrane, we have connective tissue. This is the same thing here. Okay, so this slide, keep in mind. Next slide is the tunica media. Again, we spoke of or hinted to the smooth muscles. Now you see them on the slide. So again, we have smooth muscles playing a role. Okay, again, make a note of these three slides that I'm going over. So we have tunica intima, now tunica media, and the next one's going to be tunica externa. Now this slide is important for two reasons. It has the collagen fibers, which is basically your connective tissue, and it has your elastic fibers. Now what you're going to learn from this slide and the next few is that the elastic fibers tend to be more plentiful in the AA side. Now what do I mean that, by that? The elastic fibers are plentiful for the arteries and the arterioles, enabling them to do what? Create the high pressure that we're going to need to move the blood forward. Veins, on the other hand, contain elastic fibers and smooth muscles, but much less. And that is why page 709's picture and chart are so important. Now, what you're going to find is that the veins tend to have a larger diameter. So veins tend to have a larger diameter, but they have a thin wall. Let me say that again. So veins, they tend to have a larger diameter, but they have thin walls. So what makes the blood move through the AA so strongly? It's the elastic fibers that stretch the blood vessel when blood goes through them, and then they recoil back, and basically like the way you do your toothpaste, when you're running low on the toothpaste, you squeeze and pump the rest of the toothpaste out. That's exactly what the arteries do and the arterioles do. They squeeze the remaining stuff out of that area and move it forward. Okay, next. The slide I spoke of that is important on page 709 is this one. Now this chart is first talking about the artery. Notice, much thicker wall. You can see it from this picture. They show you that the lumen of the artery is here and then the very thick wall of the artery. Veins, on the other hand, are larger in diameter but have a very thin wall. That is important. Okay, next, same page, 709. On this page, we see veins shown. It has a relatively thinner wall. So they have a thinner wall. Now let's look at this line in the chart. It says internal elastic membrane absent. External elastic membrane absent. That is why the veins lack that same blood pressure. Veins will have less blood pressure in comparison to the AA side. So what you're going to see in a picture in a chart form is typically AA having a higher blood pressure, C having the lowest, and then the VV coming back towards the higher blood pressure, but never really reaching the same level as the starting AA. Why? Because they lack the elastic membrane. That elastic fiber, that elastic membrane is missing, and therefore it doesn't have that nice recoil that the arteries do. Next slide. Okay, let me back up for a moment. I want to show this one. See how it says for the artery, internal elastic, external elastic is present and present for the artery. That is the difference, the key difference between the artery and the vein. Okay, a moment ago I had flashed this particular slide. Ignore it, it comes up later. Next slide is this one. Again, I'm not concerned with that. We'll see that later. Same is true for these formulas. It'll come up later. Now, we're going to continue with this slide. 
This slide is found on page 709 below the picture and the chart. So as you can see, page 709 is a vital page. We're going to run through these. We have arteries and veins that run side by side. So if blood is going down the arteries, blood is coming back by way of veins. So there's this parallel circulation system. Arteries have thicker walls, as I've already mentioned, and they have a higher blood pressure. If you have a collapsed artery, you can see it, it has a very small lumen. Veins, on the other hand, are larger, and veins are lined with material that will contract. Remember, veins do not have the elastic membrane, so veins must have something that allows the blood pressure to come back closer to the AA side, and that's the lining of the vein. So the vein's lining allows it to contract. Arteries do not have such a lining. They rely totally on that elastic membrane. It even says it down here. So arteries are more elastic. Last one, veins have valves. These are the one-way valves that you often see when women often talk about varicose veins and failed valves in those spider veins. So when you have that varicose vein issue, it's the valve that has failed, and that's why your veins pop out in your leg like that. And that's why they wear stockings or hosiery kind of thing to help them with the blood moving up. Okay, next slide. Next slide we have arteries. Now I've already mentioned that arteries are very elastic. So that we've already talked about. Then what will happen? The arteries will stretch and that stretching will help recoil and move the blood forward. Now words like A and S and sympathetic apply. Now this is different from many other systems. In 2401 at the end of the course when we were talking about the autonomic nervous system, you learned that it's the sympathetic that plays a key unilateral vagus tone issue. Now what does that mean? That means that it's very much like only having a gas pedal to move your car. So if you apply the gas, the car moves forward. You take back on the gas pedal and the car slows down or stops. So there's only a sympathetic system here. More sympathetic, the more you're going to have your blood pressure go up. You slim down the sympathetic, the less you'll have. So the contraction and the relaxation is totally done by sympathetic. More sympathetic, more constriction, more constriction, blood pressure goes up. The other way around. Less sympathetic means more dilation, which means that the blood pressure slows down. Okay. That's what we're getting at. So it's only a unilateral control on, by way of the sympathetic. Next slide. Now, this slide we did see at the very end of chapter 20. It was one of my last lines in that section on that video. And we talked about vasoconstriction, vasodilation. So if your blood vessels that are coming off, such as the aorta, do not do a good job at removing blood away from the heart, then you're going to have a higher afterload. Same is true for your peripheral blood pressure. So if you've got something like DVT, deep, deep vein thrombosis, or you have PAD, peripheral artery disease, then you're going to have a problem of getting blood back to the heart. And remember the rule. If blood does not come back to the heart well, it means less comes back, that means less leaves the heart as well. Remember Frank Starling's principle. So again, these two chapters of chapter 20 and 21 are very linked together. The third thing we'll see that we haven't yet is capillary blood flow. So even the capillaries have a way to control the amount of blood flow going through them. Next slide. Okay, we've already talked about this. Please make a note that the arteries are, of course, elastic and muscular. And that sort of makes sense from what we've said so far. So arteries are elastic and muscular.
Here's what the elastic involves. Elasticity evens out the pulse force. So it squeezes just right. We've already talked about these two to get today. Pulmonary trunk going to the lungs, the aorta going to the rest of the body. They are very elastic. Okay, so very elastic. And that's how they're able to squeeze the blood forward. So that's the elastic artery part. Then we have the muscular one. Okay, so there are some that are very muscular. Okay, that takes care of arteries. Next slide. Arterioles. Now we're going to add one thing to this slide, which I've already mentioned. They are very stimulated by electrical and chemical. So electrical and chemical stimulation for that. Okay, next slide. Artery diameter. Now this is the story we mentioned. Now notice this line right here. Sympathetic and endocrine. Notice it does not mention parasympathetic. It only mentions sympathetic because it's a unilateral approach. You have more sympathetic, more squeezing. Less sympathetic, less squeezing. Now remember I said sympathetic goes with nervous system, endocrine, endocrine, therefore chemical. So we have an electrical and a chemical like usual. Again, the author is mentioning the resistance is controlled by who? Arterioles. So if you raise the resistance, if you increase the resistance, you're going to slow the blood down a bit. Okay, next slide. Next slide is aneurysm. Now, this is a sad situation for some sports people where they were born with a weak blood vessel, typically an aorta. And they did not realize that although they had a weak blood vessel, they were playing sports, that weakness got weaker and weaker and eventually the blood vessel popped. And that's an aneurysm. It's very difficult to detect unless you're looking for it. And it usually happens when you're actively exercising and suddenly a blood vessel pops. And if it's a very large blood vessel like an aorta, that would be a 911 situation. Okay. So it does happen. Okay, now the next slide is an important one. The next slide, which is this one now, is highly related to page 709. So what I've done from chapter 21 so far is heavily summarized on pages 709 and this page that we're now looking at. So 709 and 711 is or are the pages that we need to look at. On this slide, you can see elastic artery. You see the endothelium, which is your epithelial lining. You see the tunica media, the tunica sterna, and you see a lot of elastic here. Same is true for here. And notice that the elastic is starting to go away by the time we get to the arterioles. And then we have capillaries, which have very little of these features. And we have two kinds of capillaries, the continuous capillary and the fenestrated capillary. We'll see those in a moment. So continuous capillary, fenestrated capillary. Then we have our venule. Now as you go up, you see what's happening. You see that the lining is the only thing that's still there. The elastic and the muscle that you see are less and less. But you do see a larger lumen. So veins, as I said, have a larger lumen, but a thicker, uh, rather a thinner wall but what are they relying on? They're relying on the lining to contract. So let me say that again. So veins have a thinner wall, larger diameter, so thinner wall, larger diameter, and they're relying heavily on the, the flexibility of the lining because they lack the elastic, so they're relying on that lining to contract and move the blood forward. Okay, next slide. This is what we saw a moment ago, the continuous capillary, fenestrated capillary. Here's another view. In this one we see that it's heavily packed up 
Here's a nice view of an artery that's already packed up with plaque. Here's another view showing you again the plaque that's built up. Okay, and now we move to capillaries. Now this slide I really don't care too much about, so we'll move forward. And this slide is important. Now this slide shows you that there is no tunica media, no tunica externa, and we already said that the diameter of a capillary is roughly that of a red blood cell. Now have you noticed from chapters 19, 20, and 21 that we keep talking about the capillary being the diameter of roughly a red blood cell? The purpose of that is because of gas exchange, and that's an important story later. Okay, so this slide is important to understand there's no tunica media, no tunica externa. Okay, now, before I go forward, keep in mind that the capillaries have the lowest velocity. The lowest velocity. That means blood slows down dramatically in the capillaries. Now, why would you want blood to slow down in the capillaries? So you can do what? Gas exchange. You can drop off your oxygen and pick up the carbon dioxide. So the blood flow or velocity is the lowest. However, if you were to take all of your blood vessels and group them and cut them open, in terms of surface area, the capillaries would have the largest surface area. And it makes sense because there are more capillaries in the body in terms of surface area. So if you opened up all the arteries, they would occupy a certain amount of space. You open up all the arterioles, cut them open, occupy a certain amount of space. Same is true for venules and veins. But capillaries, if you cut them open, it would occupy, just as an exaggeration, something like a big football field. So we have a lot of capillary surface area for gas exchange. Okay, moving to the next slide. Here we have continuous capillaries. Make a note of what continuous capillaries are all about. You will see them in different tissues. So you'll see them again. Okay. So we have continuous capillaries. They allow for things like movement of water, solids, lipid soluble materials, but they do not allow blood cells and plasma protein to go by. That will come up later in the chapter. So continuous capillaries. So they block blood cells and pr plasma proteins. You do not want these two, for example, leaking into your urine. So somewhere, somehow, we must have something like a continuous capillary in the kidney system. And we'll see that in a little while. Next slide. Sp specialized ones. So these are special continuous capillaries. In 2401, you learned about these, which are the blood-brain barriers of the nervous system. They are very restrictive. They don't let certain things through. Right. Next type that we have is fenestrated capillaries. I mentioned something about kidneys a moment ago. Well, that's an example. So we have fenestrated capillaries as well in the kidneys. So we have fenestrated, continuous, those are the key ones. Now your author brings this next slide in. Some people refer to this as the sinusoid capillaries. And that's the third type to keep in mind. Okay, so we have fenestrated, we have continuous, and we have the sinusoidal. Okay, next slide. For me, the next slide is this one, referring to the capillary bed. Now, although I am talking about this slide, I'm actually talking about the picture that follows. We have what's called pre-capillary sphincters. And as I said, it is important to prevent pooling. Now, in Chapter 20's video, I did mention pooling being a bad thing. Well, you don't want blood to pool in the capillary region either. Remember, capillaries have a low velocity but you still want blood to move forward. And it does it through the pre-capillary sphincter. So it sort of guides how much blood flow we should have. Sort of like a traffic cop who is at the intersection and the lights have gone out and they are ushering people and sort of 
moving on the traffic within that intersection. Now let me show you a picture of that. So here's a pre-capillary sphincter shown right there. There's another one there, another one there. And what they do is they guide the blood flow. If it's too much blood flow, they slow it down. If it's going to be altered blood flow, they have a way of doing that. So as you can see, there's an area of consistent blood flow and an area of variable, all based upon the pre-capillary sphincters. Okay, next slide. I don't care too much about these, but these are sort of in-between types of movements. The next term for me that's important is this one, anastomosis. We talked about it at the end of 2401. We talked about it in 2402 in the chapter on the heart. And anastomosis simply means branching. They referred to it as a generic term for branching of blood vessels or even branching of nerves. So that's a generic term for branching. Okay, next slide. Next slide is angiogenesis, formation of a new blood vessel. Now, typically, we don't have a strong ability to do that. But with this chemical here called vascular endothelial growth factor, we're able to produce more blood vessels around that growing cell region. Now, cancer cells are very good at this. So cancer cells have the greatest ability to produce new blood vessels. And we call it, for cancer cells, neoangiogenesis, the production of new blood vessels. Why? Notice it says, occurs in the embryo as tissues and organs develop. That is why I said that earlier on, sort of like what cancer cells, cancer cells are very much like an embryo cell. They have a high mitotic rate. So embryo cells, cancer cells, they make more blood vessels to help you develop. Next slide. Vasomotor. Don't really care for this slide. Vein. This slide is important. We've said it many times. We're just going to say it again. What do veins do? Return blood to the heart. What are the two main types of veins that are glorified veins? the superior vena cava, inferior vena cava. We've already mentioned that they have a larger diameter, but they have a thinner wall and a lower blood pressure. Remember the story about the AACVV. VV never gets back to the same level as AA. Next slide. We have venules. Okay. We have veins. Again, we're going to see less and less of this elastic fiber, less and less of the smooth as we go along. Okay. Large veins, same thing. Now remember we said veins have what? Valves. Why do veins have valves? To prevent the regurgitation back and to provide compression to move the blood forward. Now if you are a jet fighter pilot, and you're doing all these G rolls as they call it, you're going to have blood going down to your leg and not wanting to come back up when you do some of these high speed jet maneuvers. Well, they wear special suits with bladders in them that squeeze your leg. And when they squeeze the leg, they're helping these valves do what? Bring blood back to the head, to the heart, so you don't pass out. Now, what does it look like? It looks like this. So this picture here shows you the valves open and closed, allowing the blood to go in a one-way direction back to the heart. This is what I'm speaking of when I say that you, you can have a problem with artery disease. So if you have a problem with artery or vein disease, PAD, that's the problem. Okay, next slide. Next slide for me is this one. Now, this slide has numbers on it. Some of them are important, but they're going to be rounded off numbers. And when we look at this pie chart here, we see vein, vein, vein in terms of the venous system. Roughly, this is 66%. So roughly 66%. Now, what does that mean? Two-thirds of my blood 
are found where if I were to froze or freeze my body down instantly. So have you ever seen the movie Judge Dredd or Demolition Man where Sylvester Stallone was instantly frozen? Well, if we freeze your body like that, we're going to find 66% of your blood to be in the veins. So 66% of your blood. That means 66% of your five liters that we learned in chapter 17, 18, whatever it was. Okay? So you see, it's really important to understand that most of your blood is found in the veins. Okay? So most of your blood is found in the veins. Now the irony is this one right here. And I'm going to round that number of 7% to 5% to make it an easy number to remember. Now it says 5% or 7% here, 5% of my blood is in the capillaries. Now Nemesh, are you telling me that only 5% of my 5 liters are actually being used by the cells at any given point in time? Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. So you're never really using all of your 5 liters. Matter of fact, you're only using 5% of the 5 liters. Now, how is, it that how is that enough to satisfy all my trillion cells? But remember, capillaries account for the largest surface area of any of these vessels that you see on this pie chart. So even though only 5% of my blood is actually undergoing gas exchange, it is plenty. Okay, so it is plenty. So we're not using all five liters of my blood at any given point in time. We're only using 5%. That right there should be an astonishing number. We're only using 5% of my five liters. Okay? That is exceptional. And it also means that since capillaries have a high surface area, we're more than adequate in supplying all of the needs we have. Now, let's make sure we're together before we move forward. Most of my blood is found where? In the veins and venules. So two-thirds, 66% are in the veins and venules at any given time. Only 5% or so are in the capillaries. Okay, let's move forward. Next slide. Okay. Now, this word right here, capacitance, simply means the ability to stretch. Now there's a nice little line right here, relationship between blood volume and blood pressure. What we're going to learn in this chapter and tying it together with chapter 20 is that when blood volume goes up, blood pressure goes up. When blood volume goes down, blood pressure goes down. Okay. That's a key thing. So the object of the game is to maintain blood volume which helps us maintain blood pressure. Okay, next slide. Okay, then we have venous response to blood loss. Okay, so if you're starting to lose blood, look what happens. Vasomotors stimulate sympathetic nerves. And the systemic veins will constrict. Now you would think that that would be a bad thing in a way because if the veins constrict, more blood vessels are pushing blood forward and if it's a loss in a vein, more blood would be actually coming out of your body. You would actually increase your blood loss. That is true. But keep in mind that we have a big chunk of our blood where? In the veins. And our object of the game is to get what? That blood back to the heart. Yes, Nemesh, 66% or so of our blood is in the vein. We can afford to lose a little bit of it, but the object of the game is to get that back where? To the heart. Remember, the rule is venous return. We got to get it back to the heart so it has something to pump forward once it is oxygenated. Okay, next line. Next slide. Okay, really don't care too much about this. This is actually explaining the same story about moving the fluids forward. Remember, it's equal to cardiac output. That means what moves in the blood vessels is equal to what comes out of the heart. Again, back to Frank Starling's law. Now, this picture is important. 
Cardiac output means more blood goes to the arteries. The blood pressure goes up, and that's related to the resistance. And so if it's narrow, it slows it down, and that's what we're doing here. Remember, we want to slow it down before it gets to the capillaries. So that's where we have peripheral resistance. Then, once we're in the capillaries, we've done our thing, we want to do what? Move the blood forward and have what? A greater cardiac output. How can we have a greater cardiac output unless we have what? A greater venous return. It's a greater cardiac output will only happen if we have a greater venous return. Next slide. All of this, same thing. I'm not really concerned too much about this one. We already know that things move because of pressure gradient. That's all this says. Same as here. Don't really care too much about that. Okay, this slide. Now this slide is important. This slide lets you know that when we are actually looking at blood pressure, we have three kinds of pressures involved. We have the blood pressure itself, measured in millimeters of mercury for the artery. We have the capillary hydrostatic pressure, pressure within the capillary beds. So in that interstitial fluid, that interstitial fluid is pushing too. And then we have venous pressure, which is the blood going back to the heart. So we have blood coming from the heart. We have blood or fluids within the capillaries that plays a role. They're actually pushing back. And then we have venous pressure getting you back to the heart. Okay. Next slide. Okay. Don't care too much about that. I do care for this. This slide explains total peripheral resistance. These three things are going to slow down the blood. One is vascular resistance. So if there is more of you, the example I often give is Oprah when she gained weight. If there's more of Oprah to love because she's gained weight and more heavy set, what's the problem? There's more blood vessel. And more blood vessel means more resistance. And so the blood pressure is actually going to want to do what? Go down. And if that's the case, what is the body going to do in order to react to that? The heart's going to have to work harder. Okay. So the heart is now going to be forced to generate a greater pressure to counter the vascular resistance. So vascular resistance is what slows down your blood. Then we have blood viscosity. Now we already know the word hematocrit, which is the percentage of red blood cells in whole blood. If you go mountain climbing often, and you're in the high elevations, forcing your kidney to produce erythropoietin that we learned before, and erythropoietin goes to your bone marrow and takes and tells your bone marrow to make more red blood cells, your blood is going to become more viscous, thicker. And as you know, water pours more easily than, say, pancake syrup. So blood viscosity plays a role. So if your hematocrit goes up, your blood viscosity is going to go up. The last one is turbulence. If you got some narrowing of your blood vessel, like the earlier picture I showed with plaque buildup, it's going to actually change the flow of the blood in your blood vessels. It's going to cause a lot of turbulence. And turbulence, like on an airplane, a turbulence will slow the plane down. It will not allow the blood or air, if you're using the plane example, to move smoothly. So these three things actually slow the blood down. Here they are one at a time. So vascular resistance. Notice it says depends on vessel length and vessel diameter. Okay. So this right here is an example of resistance. So it says, resistance increases exponentially as the vessel diameter decreases. The smaller the vessel, the more the resistance. 
the smaller the vessel, the more the resistance. Next slide. We have viscosity, and we've already said that blood is thicker than water, and blood will even get even more thick if you increase your hematocrit. Next, we have turbulence. Notice it says if you have plaque buildup, and that was the example I gave earlier, plaque buildup will cause abnormal turbulence. And therefore, the blood will not move through nice and smooth. Here's a picture version of that. So at the bottom of this picture, they show you turbulence because of the plaque. And notice that does do what? Here's a nice flow through it. And now we have a shabby flow going through it because of the turbulence. This picture is important to study. So you have a nice flow and then the plaque builds up here and it slows it down because of turbulence. Okay, next slide. Now this was a slide that the author put up earlier in this set and it was not really where it belonged. Now it belongs in this place. So it is a good idea to browse through this slide now. So we have blood flow, blood pressure, hydrostatic pressure, peripheral resistance, and then regular resistance. So this slide is important to look at. Next one, this is the resistance only. So we have turbulence, vascular res resistance, and viscosity. And we've already talked about those. Okay. This is a formula. I really don't care too much about this. Please browse through it, especially the bottom one because that's what we said a moment ago, that there is an exponential increase in resistance for every time the vessel becomes narrower. So the more narrower the blood vessel, the bigger increase in resistance. So that's important. Next slide. These are the things we just talked about. So vessel diameter plays a role, cross-sectional area plays a role, Pressures play a role, and the velocity plays a role. Now let's go from the last one up. We said that the velocity of blood flow is highest at the AA, lowest at the C, and it does come back a little bit at the VV. So that's your bottom bullet there. Pressures start off high at the AA. They go down just a tad at the C and they come back again at the VV. Cross-sectional. The highest cross-sectional area is the capillary. Next, vessel diameter. The vessel diameter is where? Largest at the veins. Right, largest at the veins. Okay, next slide. This slide is one to look at, just a browse through showing you that we have a large diameter and then the diameter decreases at the capillaries and it goes back again. And notice the veins have what? The highest blood vessel diameter. So veins have the highest blood vessel diameter. Okay, next this is the cross-sectional area. So we see not so much, not so much, and the highest cross-sectional area is for the capillaries. Okay, next slide. This one is showing you how the blood pressure actually decreases on the way down. So blood pressure is going to be decreasing on the way down. Okay, next slide. Here's your velocity. This is my chart I keep talking about. The AA side has a high velocity, capillary has the lowest velocity, and the velocity increases but never returns to the same level as the AA side. This picture I've been harping on a lot. Next slide, we have the systolic pressure and the diastolic pressure. Systolic is, of course, when we have ventricle systole. So when that ventricle, the left and the right, and especially the left, when the left ventricle squeezes, 
it's going to do what? Create a lot of pressure going out of that aortic valve. And that's going to relate to the systolic pressure. The diastolic pressure is when the ventricles are actually resting. So your blood is actually moving and the pressure changes based upon the heart. So the heart is actually guiding the blood pressure. Ventricle systole, blood pressure is high. Diastole pressure is when the ventricles are resting. Okay, next slide. This slide, just look at. I don't care too much about this one. Okay, maybe one question at the max on this one. Next slide. Okay, this is a normal blood pressure of 120 over 80. Hypertension is now considered greater than 140 over 90. And then we have hypotension is when you have low blood pressure. Now what does it mean to be 140 over 90 or 120 over 80? It means that when the left ventricle of the heart is squeezing, when the left ventricle of the heart is squeezing, it takes 120 millimeters of mercury pressure to pop that aortic valve open and move the blood through the aorta. In the case of someone with hypertension, it now means that that same heart has to exert 140 millimeters of pressure just to get through that aortic valve. So when the top number gets higher and higher, so the larger that top number, the first number, the greater the left ventricle will have to exert in order to pop open that aortic valve and move blood around. So if someone that had a higher afterload, this is what would happen. Because a higher afterload means less stroke volume. And that's because you're not exerting enough pressure. So what does the body do to compensate? It raises the blood pressure to help maintain that stroke volume. So the pressure, the pressure has to be higher in order for that aortic valve to pop open and move the blood forward. Okay, what about the bottom number? If the bottom number goes up, such as from 80 to 90, that bottom number means that to go from the top half of the heart, which is the atrias, down to the ventricles, that itself means more. Now why am I mentioning the top now? Because remember, when we have diastole for blood pressure, we're saying that the ventricles are at rest. If ventricles are resting, it means that the atrias must be contracting. So if the atrias are squeezing and that bottom number rises over time, it means that the heart, the top half, has to exert a lot of force just to get the blood to the bottom half. And that's not good. Okay? So when you have the bottom number and the top number going up, it means that the top half and the bottom half are now having to work harder to move blood around. If the top number of 140 or 120 go up, it's just the bottom half working harder. If the 80 and the 90 here go up, that means now the top half is working harder to get the blood from top half to bottom half of the heart. And that's not good. Next slide. Okay, elastic rebound. We've already mentioned this. We said that when we have systole, so it says stretches during systole. So when I am pumping from the left ventricle, and this is why the slides are important with the picture. When I am pumping the left ventricle and I pop open the aortic valve, blood is going to rush into that aorta, which is basically an artery. When blood goes into that artery, that aorta, it's going to stretch it. And what will happen? When that ventricle goes into diastole, which is when the ventricle rests and that aortic valve closes, it's going to be the recoil of that aorta or that artery that's going to move the blood forward. So in essence, look what it says here. To keep blood moving forward. So let's say that again. 
to keep blood moving forward during diastole. Now, diastole of who? The ventricle. So when the ventricle is resting, we still want blood, which is on top of the aortic valve, to move forward. How do I do that? Well, when I actually pumped the ventricle, it actually sort of stretched my aorta. And then when the valve finally closed, when that aortic valve closed, the recoil of the artery actually pushed the blood forward. So when the heart is resting, meaning when the ventricle is in diastole, blood is actually moving forward on top of that aortic valve by the stretching and the recoil of that blood vessel. Next slide. Okay, this slide, the key thing is this one right here. Blood pressure decreases with friction, and that common sense makes sense. So blood pressure will decrease with friction. Next slide for me is this one. Venous pressure and venous return. Notice, determines the amount of blood arriving at the right atrium each minute. Remember the rule. If you have a crappy venous return, you're going to have crappy amount of blood getting back to the right atrium. And if you have crappy blood getting to the heart, you're going to have crappy amount of blood leaving the heart. Remember the rule. What goes in must come out. Okay. So the object of the game is to get the blood back to the right atrium. And there are several things that do that. And they all fall under the heading of venous return. Now, since the venous return has a low blood pressure in comparison to the AA side, it's going to need some help. One of them we've already learned, and that is the one-way valves in the veins. But there are other things, too. Okay, next slide. This slide is mentioning some of them. For example, skeletal muscle pump. That's what this first one is. Skeletal muscle pump. So when you move your body around and not be a couch potato and you move around, your skeletal muscles are actually squeezing, like the toothpaste example, squeezing your blood through the one-way valves that are found in the veins. So your skeletal muscles are sort of pumping the blood up back to the right atrium. The next one is respiratory pump. So when we, we actually breathe, when we're breathing, we're actually pushing the diaphragm down. And of course, we do not have holes in our toes. So when we push down, when we inhale and exhale, when we push down, it actually helps move the blood from our toes back up again. So let's recap what we have so far. So far we have for venous return, the skeletal muscle pump, the one-way valves in the veins, and we have respiratory pump. So those three, three things aid in venous return. Okay, next, next slide. Okay, now, now we're looking at the capillary again. These are the three things that occur within the capillary. We have diffusion, filtration, and reabsorption. So diffusion, filtration, reabsorption. Now the rule of thumb is filtration always means leaving the blood. So filtration means leaving the blood. Reabsorption always means coming back into blood. Okay, so filtration means leaving the blood. Reabsorption means coming back to the blood. Let's go through each of them again. The first slide here talks about diffusion. You already know what diffusion is. So we have diffusion of gases from high concentration to low concentration within the capillary. So oxygen wants to come into the cell space and carbon dioxide wants to leave the cell space. And of course, we know that ions want to move too. 
and ions will move according to their concentration gradient. Okay. So this slide is just to let you know that. Now remember, fenestrated capillaries have to do with solutes. So fenestrated capillaries deal with solutes. Okay. That's important to keep in mind. So fenestrated capillaries with our solutes. <clears throat> okay, next slide. Next slide. Okay, now let's return to this slide. Diffusion routes. So we have a continuation. We have large water soluble, soluble compounds going through the fenestrated capillaries. We have lipid solubles that can diffuse right through because lipid dissolves lipid. And most of your cell membrane is what? A lipid nature. So carbon dioxide and oxygen, they're able to go right through. And again, they're going to move according to their concentration gradient. So this slide and the last slide is definitely worth looking at. Now we move to filtration. I've already told you that filtration is leaving the blood and going into the cell space. And they move based upon the hydrostatic pressure. The next slide is reabsorption. Now this one is very important, especially with this guy. It's called blood colloidal osmotic pressure. It says, equals pressure required to prevent osmosis. You do not want the fluids in the interstitial space to move when you don't want them to move. Now look what it says. Caused by the suspended blood proteins that are too large to go through the capillary walls. Now what does this say? It says that if I have fluids in my blood and I do not want to lose all this fluid directly into the cell space all at once, then I'm going to have to have a blood colloidal osmotic pressure. And that's because of the blood plasma proteins. And the key one I mentioned before in chapter 18 is albumin. That's very important to remember. So when they say suspended blood proteins, they're talking about albumin in our blood. Now what is the deal about this? If for some reason albumin leaks in from our blood into the cell space, and that is a no-no, that's a bad thing. If that happens, the fluids in our blood will suddenly leak into the cell space. And what does that mean? You are going to drop your blood volume dramatically because the fluids in your blood will just soak right into the cell space and your blood volume that moves around will drop. And remember the rule, if blood volume ever drops, blood pressure drops as well. So that is a very dire situation if this ever happens. So the object of the game is not to have the blood plasma proteins leak into the cell space. Now, I'm going to give you a number. My number is 85%. What does that mean? It means that a big chunk of your fluids that are in the cell space actually return, and that is why we call it reabsorption, they actually return into the blood. So this is how we maintain our blood volume, our blood pressure. So the proteins that are there are actually sort of sucking the fluids out of the cell space and into the blood, maintaining blood volume, blood pressure. So this paragraph on page 723 is a vital one. It also accounts for swelling in your body. So if you got swelling in your body in places, it's primarily due to some fault in this scenario. So if you got swelling in the cell space, this is what you got to fix. Okay, moving forward. This picture is on page 723. It is worthwhile looking at. Next, next slide is this one. 
there is a nice communication between filtration and reabsorption. Now it says, accelerates distribution of nutrients, hormones, and gases. So you have filtration and reabsorption occurring to help move these things around. So nutrients, hormones, and gases move around because of the nice connection between the two. Next slide. Okay, this slide is really important, especially number four. Has a flushing action that carries toxins and other stimuli out of the cell space. Okay. So if you have germs, they're hiding in the cell space, it's the filtration and the reabsorption that is going to flush and clean out that cell space. It's almost like what you do with a vacuum cleaner. You got dirt and everything in your carpet, you use a vacuum cleaner to get it out of the carpet. Filtration and reabsorption is very much like that. It floods the area and then reabsorption removes it and gets it back into your blood. Okay. Now, before we go forward, I need for you to understand the directionality of this capillary. At one end of the capillary, we have our AA, and I'm now referring to the AACVV. At one end, we have our AA. The AA side has a great deal of push moving fluids into the cell space. So remember I said filtration is moving away from the blood or out of the blood and into the cell space. So the AA side of our capillary is undergoing more filtration. So the AA side of our capillary is undergoing filtration. The VV side of our capillary is undergoing reabsorption. Now, I know a picture is best to explain this, and so there is one for you, and that is this picture. This picture shows you that at the AA side, I have more what? Filtration. At the VV side, I have more what? Reabsorption. Now these numbers here of plus and minus, well that simply says that on this side, the AA side, I have a greater push for filtration. On this side, the minus number represents that at the VV side, I have reabsorption. And that is what basically I've said down here. So the BCOP at this end, at the VV end, it is the BCOP that allows for reabsorption. I know that's a test question somewhere. So why do I have reabsorption at the VV side? It's because of the greater blood colloidal osmotic pressure. Let's say that sentence again. So what accounts for the reabsorption? The greater blood colloidal osmotic pressure, the BCOP. And earlier, I called out a plasma protein called albumin. That is why we have reabsorption at the VV side. At the AA side, we have filtration, primarily because of CHP, which is really because of the heart. So BCOP, that we saw over here, BCOP is due to albumin, and CHP, CHP, capillary hydrostatic pressure, is due to the heart blood pressure. So the blood pressure from the heart is causing CHP. Very, very important slide. Now the slides I just passed up to get to this picture, I'm going to back up to. And they're going to say the same thing that we've said. Okay, so this is the slide that I was on. And it says, hydrostatic pressure forces water out. And when it says pushes water out, it's really referring to pushing water out of your blood. The osmotic pressure is doing what? Pushing fluids back into the blood. 
So osmotic pressure moves fluid back into blood. Hydrostatic pushes fluid out of the blood. Next slide. Okay. What I've just said is now here. So the same thing is now here. Okay. Okay. So same thing, same information. Okay. Next slide. Okay. Same thing here too. So what happens here? Blood colloidal osmotic pressure does what? Moves fluid back into the capillary. From where? From the interstitial fluid. So my comment before is now in words for you. So blood colloidal osmotic pressure moves it back into the blood from the cell space. And CHP moves it out of the capillaries into where? Interstitial fluid. Okay. So again, my story holds true there. Okay. Next, we have this. Net filtration pressure. Now the math is worthwhile, but keep in mind that the value of IHP and ICOP are minimal. So even the author says that it's really an issue of just CHP versus BCOP. So at the AA side, it's CHP that dictates. On the VV side, it's BCOP. Next, we have this line. It's a summary of what we just said. What did I tell you? The AA side of a capillary, fluids move where? Into the cell space. So at the AA side, they move into the cell space. At the VV side, they move back into the blood. Same thing. Okay. We've already talked about this. We'll move forward. I've already showed you this picture. We're going to move forward. And now we have this story. Now this slide is an important one. This lets you know what happens if you have issues. For example, increase in CHP. Fluids will do what? Move out of blood. So if you have a large CHP, you're going to cause edema, swelling. Okay. If you have a problem with BCOP, okay, you're going to have a problem with swelling because you're not getting the blood fluid back into blood. So the fluid does not go back into blood. Dehydration, you're going to have to do what? If you're dehydrated, you're going to have to get the blood back, or the fluids rather, back into blood. And remember the rule. If the fluids are going back into blood, what's the rule again? Reabsorption always means back into blood. If you're bleeding, what do you got to do? Why do you raise your arm if you have an arm injury? Why do you raise your arm up above your heart? To slow down the blood flow. Because if you're bleeding, you need to slow down the blood flow. You got a finger cut swinging your hands downwards is not going to help. You need to raise your hand above to slow down the blood flow. Okay, next slide. Okay, this slide, tissue perfusion. It's a definition one. So the definition says, what's perfusion? How blood moves through the tissues. What are we doing? We're bringing in oxygen and nutrients and we're taking away the CO2 and the waste, like urea. What's it affected by? Cardiac output. So how much is coming out? Peripheral resistance, dealing with how well the blood vessels are moving the blood and the blood pressure. This line is your biggest take home message. If you got good cardiac output, you have good peripheral resistance to slow down and improve your blood flow back to the heart, then you're going to have a good blood pressure. If your cardiac output is lousy, your resistance is lousy, then your blood pressure is going to be lousy. Okay? Very, very important to keep that in mind. 
Okay, next slide. Next slide is this one. Cardiovascular regulation changes blood flow to a specific area. Okay, not a big deal, just to let you know that it's really the changes in the blood flow that matter. So I don't really care too much for that one. Now this is important. Remember the rule, Nemish's 95% rule says I can do what? Control things neurally, which is your electrical, and endocrine, which is your chemical. So we have a neural and endocrine. Of course, as I mentioned, we're really going to be looking at the arterioles doing that. So it's primarily going to be the arterioles that are doing it. Okay, now, we also have local regulation, and that's what we're going to see first. So this slide is important. Here's a picture version of the autoregulation, and this is local. So autoregulation is local. Remember, local implies what? Precapillary sphincters. So this is a local issue in the neighborhood of your interstitial area. So this is autoregulation, using the peri or the precapillary sphincters. We either vasodilate, vasoconstrict, based upon the local needs. Okay. This flow chart is very important to keep in mind. So you have stresses like trauma, temperature, chemical changes like less oxygen or more carbon dioxide or changes in pH, or increased tissue activity because you are now running or exercising and the demand is higher. So that demand being higher is going to adjust this. So this picture is definitely worth keeping in mind. The next picture is this one. Okay, starting with this picture, we have central regulation. Now this picture comes into play only if auto regulation is ineffective. So if the local control doesn't work, then this kicks in. For neural, we have primarily who acting? The heart, blood vessels. So heart and blood vessels will play a role here. Notice it says sympathetic. Now why is that? Because the body's blood pressure as a normal tendency is to rise. Remember, our goal is to keep the brain and the heart happy. So we're going to have more likelihood of blood pressure going up than blood pressure coming down. Again, you see what kind of language here for the endocrine one. Long-term increase in blood volume and blood pressure. You don't see anything here talking about decreasing blood pressure, but more of raising the blood pressure. Because the tendency is that we're going to need to raise the blood pressure to keep people like the brain and the heart happy. Okay, moving forward. Next slide. Now, here's your autoregulation again. So this is now the wordage with that. Make sure you make a note of this slide. So make sure you make a note of this slide. We see words like this, low O2, high CO2, acidic environment, high concentrations of potassium, high hydrogen ions, making it acidic. We have things like histamine from our basophils, the mast cells, so inflammation making histamine, and even a elevated local temperature. So this was in the chart form earlier. Okay, next slide. Okay, on this slide, we see what we can do. So these are our responders. So in autoregulation, we have prostaglandins, thromboxanes. We saw that earlier in chapter 20 or 19 even. We saw that. Released by damaged tissues, constricting the precapillary sphincters, and affecting the local blood flow. So that's an option that we have. Now, neurally, again, if you're okay with that previous flow chart, then this is basically the same thing. We're going to have the medulla oblongata kick in, and we're going to increase the cardiac output, primarily the sympathetic. Here we see here, 
we have our vasoconstriction, vasodilation, and then we see vasomotor tone. And remember I told you, vasomotor tone is only who? Sympathetic. That was mentioned in 2401 as well. So sympathetic for vasomotor. Again, another reason justifying why we tend to have a rise in blood pressure than less. Next slide. The baroreceptor reflexes and the chemoreceptor reflexes. The baroreceptors and chemoreceptors are found in the arch of the aorta and they're also found in the carotid body, which is in the neck. Now what do they do? You'll see them on the next slide. So baroreceptors will deal with blood pressure, chemoreceptors will deal with the changes in the blood's chemistry. And here's the comment I mentioned earlier. So we have baroreceptors found where? Carotid sinus, which is in the neck, and the aortic sinus, which is just on the aortic arch. Next slide. Here's what they do. They monitor, just like if you have a smoke detector in your home, they're monitoring whether the blood pressure is going up or the blood pressure is going down. And then they have an outcome. So if your blood pressure drops, our goal is to do what? Remember, we do not want pooling. And if your blood pressure ever drops, we are going to have pooling somewhere. And so the heart says, the brain says, pooling is bad. So what are we going to do? We're going to increase our cardiac output. More comes out with the hope and pray that what? If more comes out of the heart, more will come back to the heart. And that's what the intention is. And we do that by vasoconstriction. If the blood pressure is too high, the heart says, okay, we'll do what? We'll lower our blood pressure a bit by decreasing cardiac output. But remember, if blood pressure is rising and our decrease in cardiac output results in pooling, that's a bad thing. And that's what happens to people. Okay? They'll get swelling in their body because their blood pressure is rising and the heart's doing what? Decreasing its cardiac output, which is increasing the swelling problem. So blood pressure goes up. As a consequence, cardiac output by the heart says, hey, we need to just decrease cardiac output, we're going to have pooling somewhere. And that's also because of vasodilation. Now don't get caught up in this initial and then response. Understand the initial and then understand the response. Okay? A lot of students get caught up in understanding what's happening and they mingle what's happening with what the body will do as a response. Do not mingle the two. Okay, Here's a picture version. If we see responses to increased baroreceptor stimulation, so what's happening? Homeostasis is disturbed, blood pressure goes up. If blood pressure goes up, we sense it. Then, after sensing it, what do we do? We stimulate the inhibitory, we block the accelatory, so we're actually slowing down the heart rate. Okay, We're going to slow down this cardiac output, vasodilation and blood pressure will go down. This is the only key way for that to happen. What if we have the reverse scenario where blood pressure is dropping? If blood pressure is dropping, we actually jack up the vasoconstriction, blood pressure goes up, we jack up the cardiac output and the blood pressure goes up. Okay. So this picture and the last is very important. Now that was only for Barrow. The next one is about chemo. Again, we have chemoreceptors found where? The carotid body and the aortic body, located in the same places. Carotid body in the neck, aortic body found in the arch of the aorta. Again, they're related to who? Medulla oblongata. Okay. So they're related to the medulla oblongata. Now remember I said there's two guys to keep happy. One is the brain and the other is the heart. Here, because of chemoreceptors, we're now looking at the blood's chemistry. So this is related to the blood chemistry. 
So if some kid is being hard-headed at the store, wanting chewing gum at the checkout, and then she starts to hold her breath just to show you, okay? When she holds her breath, what's going to happen? CO2 levels will rise. So as that kid is holding their breath, as the kid's holding their breath, CO2 levels will rise, the aortic body and the carotid bodies will detect the rise in CO2 and cause the heart rate to go up because we want to do what? Get more of the CO2 from our tissues and bring them where? To the lungs. So our heart rate will go up. Okay, here's an example of something just like that. Matter of fact, it's the same storyline. It says, increases in CO2 levels, decreasing pH, so the blood's become acidic, or we have less oxygen. And look what it says. It's gonna increase the rate of breathing so you're going to do what? Breathe out this extra CO2. So respiratory rate will increase. But of course, to get it to the lungs, what's going to happen? Vasoconstriction and the greater cardiac output and blood pressure will go up too. So when you hold your breath, blood pressure will go up. Okay. And we are going to blow out the CO2 and we're going to increase our heart rate and our cardiac output and our blood pressure to get the CO2 to the lungs. And then eventually it will level off. So you see the object of the game is really what? Controlling the heart rate and blood pressure. Now, heart rate is of course self-evident, but what about blood pressure? That is the strength in the contraction. So yes, your heart will have to work harder during that time. So blood pressure is related to the strength of the contraction and heart rate is referring to how fast the heart beats. That's all the heart has as an option anyway. Either the heart rate or how strong it pumps. And you know how that's translated, right? Heart rate times stroke volume is cardiac output. Now, next slide. This slide says things like emotional states. You won the lottery. Your blood pressure can go up. Okay. So cardiac stimulation, thought processes, emotional states. Okay. You're walking down the road and you see a nice Ferrari and you're really much into cars. What's going to happen? Your heart rate's going to go up because you see a nice fancy car. Okay. That's an example. The actress that you like just happens to be walking by you, what's going to happen? Your heart rate's going to go up. Okay. So thought processes and emotional states will also make or play a role. Next line. Now we have hormonal. Remember, we just saw the neural. Now we're going to look at the hormonal. Now hormonal can have a short-term effect as well as a long-term effect. And much of this is due to the adrenal medulla. And by now, you should know that the adrenal medulla is referring to epinephrine, norepinephrine. Now, there are others as well. And in this case, our goal is not only to move the blood faster, like epinephrine will do because it stimulates cardiac output and vasoconstriction, but we also want to maintain blood volume. So in this hormone category, we have two ways of working by adrenal medulla, which will do the cardiac output and vasoconstriction, but also other hormones that will play a role in things like blood volume. So let's go to our next slide. Here's the example of the blood volume. Now, Nemish, all I see here, it says, elevates blood pressure. True, but look what it says below it. Reduces water loss. And the rule of thumb is if you raise your blood volume, you're going to raise your blood pressure. And by now, you should know that the antidiuretic hormone coming from the posterior pituitary is going to cause the kidneys to do what? Reabsorb water. And by reabsorbing water, the blood volume will go up, the blood pressure will go up. Okay, next we have the next hormone, angiotensin II. Now, angiotensin II is related to what I call the RAA. R being renin, then the second A, 
The second one is A, which is angiotensin II. And then the last one is aldosterone. So let me repeat that. We have RAA, renin, angiotensin II, and aldosterone. Now ADH will conserve water, and so blood volume, blood pressure will go up. Aldosterone will do the same thing, but this time it'll do it through the reabsorption of sodium ions. And the rule of thumb is wherever salt goes, or in this case sodium, wherever sodium goes, water follows, because we're creating an osmotic pull. So aldosterone will actually cause the reabsorption of sodium, and that's going to cause water to come with it. Again, raising the blood volume, raising the blood pressure. Again, look what it says here, responds to the fall in blood pressure. So when blood pressure goes down, these two things will raise the blood volume, therefore the blood pressure. And of course, you're going to be thirsty, so you're going to drink more water too. All right, next, we have EPO. We've already talked about this too. EPO will do what? Cause the kidneys to release EPO, and that's in response to low oxygen. So when you're in high elevations, like Mount Everest, and you're not getting enough oxygen, the kidneys will release, uh, release that, realize that, and the kidneys will release EPO. And EPO will then go to the bone marrow and tell the red blood cells to produce more. So you're going to have more red blood cells. Now what will that do? That's going to raise your hematocrit. And raising your hematocrit will increase blood viscosity, and that will help play a role in increasing your blood pressure as well. So blood pressure, blood viscosity. Next slide. This slide is a summary of the hormonal. And in each case, notice what the starting factor is. Starting is decrease in blood pressure and decrease in blood volume. Look what it says. Increase red blood cell formation will play a role in increased blood volume, blood pressure. It will also increase cardiac output, peripheral vasoconstriction and it will raise your blood pressure. There's a short-term response and a long-term response. Okay, so short-term and long-term. Okay, next slide. Now comes the heart. The heart itself has a hormone called ANP, often called atrial natriuretic peptide produced by the cells in the right atrium. Now, this is your only friend you have short term. Here's why I say that. Look what it says. It lowers the blood volume and blood pressure. As I've already said, that historically, what's going to happen as you get older? As you get older, your blood vessels in the rest of your body will weaken and it will not be as good at getting blood back to the heart. So your venous return will get sluggish. If venous return is sluggish, less blood comes back to the heart, so the heart has to work harder to get the blood out of the heart. That Frank Starling law again. This is the only friend you have that actually lowers blood volume and blood pressure. And it does so for one reason, reducing the stress on the heart. So this is the only hormone that's going to play a role in helping the heart itself. Every other hormone that you saw in all of these slides like that one, like that one, all of these pictures you saw with me a moment ago, their whole goal was to do what? Their whole goal was to raise blood volume, raise blood pressure. And when I was on one of these slides a moment ago, I said that blood pressure is going to cause more work on the left ventricle because blood pressure is related to more stroke volume. And that means I have to exert a greater pressure. This is the only hormone that works for the heart, from the heart, to prevent that. And here's a picture that goes with that. So this is its own little friend that it has. Okay, next. What we've learned is that chapter 
19 on blood, chapter 20 on heart, and chapter 21 that we're now working on, they all play a role together. And that is why at the very beginning of my video lectures, I mentioned 19, 20, and 21 working together. So when you're exercising or when there is a blood loss, they help maintain homeostasis. Next slide. Now, do you see how this slide right here keeps talking about Venus return? Okay. And again, we have that what goes in, what goes out, Frank Starling law. So we have always this Venus return story. Okay. So Venus return. So cardiac output rises based upon the Venus return and atrial stretching. So Venus return and atrial stretching. Okay, next slide. Heavy exercise. Now this is where you're going to have more work. Blood supply to brain is unaffected because the heart keeps that going. Again, what do you see here on this slide? It's the sympathetic nervous system story only. Okay, cardiac output is at the highest possible. It restricts to non-essential organs. So when you're heavily exercising, you really do not care for blood going to the digestion because when you're running around, you're not eating and digesting. Okay. So that's the goal right there. Next slide. I really don't care for this one, just to let you know, blood flow story. Okay, so the blood flow story. As you can see, not counting the skeletal muscle, because that's just self-evident, not counting the skeletal muscle. Who are the two things we keep happy? The heart and the brain. The heart and the brain. All this can be, even though there's a lot of blood flow there, they can be limited. Okay, next slide. Exercise. Regular moderate exercise lowers total cholesterol. Intense exercise can cause severe physiological stress. So you don't want to do a whole lot of intense work, but regular, rather regular moderate exercise. All right, now this slide is important. Here's why. Look at the stroke volume of a non-athlete at rest. And look at the stroke volume of a trained athlete at rest. They're actually getting more blood out even though their heart rate is lower. That's the magic. The magic is that they can get more blood out even at a low heart rate. Okay. So look at these two numbers. If you multiply these two numbers, heart rate times stroke volume, you get cardiac output. So even at a lower heart rate, they're able to get a lot of blood out. That's not true for the non-athlete at rest. They have to have a higher heart rate, and they're still not what? Getting a lot of blood out. Okay. That's the magic. That's the importance. Here we are working harder with a higher heart rate and still not getting enough blood out. And notice the cardiac output is less, even though we both have the same blood pressure. That is the magic of being a, a trained athlete. Also, if you look at the maximum, we're jacking up our blood pressure. Okay, so you can see the blood pressure going up. Our heart rate goes up, but we're only getting 104 out. The athlete gets more out even though it's at a higher heart rate. Okay. okay. So that's the magic. Yes, blood pressure goes higher than usual, but they're still able to do it with what? A lower heart rate and they're able to get more out. Higher the stroke volume means you're able to get more out with ease. Okay. And notice the cardiac output is much higher. 
So they're getting more out. Okay, next slide. So what's the object of the game? The object of the game when you're injured is to do what? Get your blood pressure back to normal. And how do I get my blood pressure back to normal? With a hemorrhage. We store blood volume. Okay, so you get your blood pressure back to normal by restoring blood volume with a hemorrhage. That's why IV is such a big deal. IV bottle, IV line starting it, and getting the fluids into the body is a very good way of retaining and maintaining blood pressure. Next slide. Here's what happens to you as a short-term issue. So this is a short-term story. Again, we always see sympathetic involved here. We also see arterioles involved and we see improving the venous return. That's a short-term effect. Again, we see the carotid and the aortic reflex. So the carotid body, aortic body. So this is what we've already learned. Now the next slide talks about the hormonal effects of it. And we've already seen those too. Okay, now here's the bad side of the story and that's shock. Shock is when you're losing far too much blood. Okay. So if you have a whole lot of blood loss, look what it says, up to 20% of your total blood volume. Remember, our blood volume total is 5 liters. You start losing 20% of that 5 liters, you're going to have a problem. And what that means is that whatever fluid you have in your blood is going to be leaking out of your blood and going into the cell space, which further does what? Lowers the blood volume. Because remember, you can only count it as blood volume as long as it stays in blood. The moment that that fluid starts seeping into the interstitial fluid, you're going to have a problem. Okay. So failure to restore blood pressure results in shock. Now we have two kinds of shock. We have the recoverable type, recoverable, recoverable type, and the one that we can't recover from. Now, the reason we can recover from one kind is because you're still able to put the IV fluids in, the blood pressure is still relatively maintainable, and you're okay. And you have not lost what? The blood plasma proteins have not seeped into the interstitial space. Now, the irreversible kind is the one where you have a problem. And in this case, you can't do much because the plasma proteins have seeped into the interstitial space. And whatever fluids you give that patient, those fluids are going to be osmotically sucked into or pulled into the interstitial space. So no matter what you do with that IV line, the more fluids you give it, all that happens because the proteins have leaked into the interstitial space, the water is going to get sucked into that interstitial space too and your blood volume will not be restored. And this is the one-way ride in the ambulance because you ain't coming back. Because no matter what they do, they will not be able to return you back because the blood volume can't be restored. Okay, here's what happens long-term for long-term restoration of blood volume. You drink a lot of water, ADH, aldosterones kick in, you are able to do what in this scenario? In this scenario, recall of fluids from interstitial space. So here we have the plasma proteins like albumin still staying in the blood. So if you've got plasma proteins in your blood and they stay in the blood, it's going to cause the BCOP to work effectively at the VV end of your capillary. So blood volume can be restored in this case. And then of course we have erythropoietin that we've already seen. Here's a picture version of what happens when you have hemorrhage or blood loss. So hemorrhage or blood loss, same basic scenario. Okay, so same basic scenario. Sympathetic again, our sensors being bare receptors, chemoreceptors, we increase cardiac output, we increase peripheral vasoconstriction, we elevate our blood volume, 
by way of ADH, aldosterone, angiotensin II, and that raises blood pressure and blood volume. Remember, they always go in the same direction. Okay, draw a line. Okay, now we have this page, vascular adaptation. Okay, so we have some areas of our body that are unique. And notice I always mention these two, the brain and the heart. So I always mention those two over and over, the brain and the heart. Okay, next, next slide. Blood flow to the brain is top priority. So you've heard me say that several times. So blood flow to the brain is top priority because it's the brain that's controlling the heart and controlling the blood vessels as well. Okay. So blood vessel constriction, all of that's controlled by the brain, therefore the brain has to work. Okay. So top priority, brain has a high oxygen demand. In my classes in 2401, when we were on the brain chapter, I usually mention 20%. That's a big chunk. So 20% of the oxygen in our blood goes to the brain. So it's very important to keep that guy happy. Next slide. Stroke. Now, a stroke is also called cerebrovascular accident. When you either have a blood clot in the brain or a blood vessel rupturing. Now a blood clot, there are some cases where the blood clot does dissolve in time and you have a limited degree of damage. However, when you have a rupture of a blood vessel in the brain, that's going to be a big deal because now you have a twofold problem. Not only do you have dead neurons everywhere because they're not getting nerve supply and blood supply, but at the same time you have fluids accumulating in the brain and the fluid itself is creating pressure on the neurons and killing them off. So a rupture in the brain is much more severe than a blockage. And they do look differently on a CT scan or MRI or anything like that. Okay? So a stroke, one way or the other, is going to stop the blood flow in the brain. And that's not good. Next slide. Next slide, we have flow through the heart. And again, high oxygen demand. Okay, so high oxygen demand. Next slide. Again, what do I do for the heart? Epinephrine. Dilates the coronary vessels, increases the heart rate, and strengthens the contractions. And of course, all of this right here is going to go with what as a formula? Strengthens contractions is going to go with stroke volume. Stroke volume and heart rate will go with cardiac output. Okay. So again, we see that. If you haven't seen that, that's important. So strengthening contractions related to stroke volume, increasing heart rate, and then when you multiply those two, you get cardiac output. Next slide. A heart attack. Now, a heart attack is when you have a blood clot or some type of blockage in the coronary blood flow. Caused by, can cause angina, that's a chest pain. Now, just because you have angina does not mean you're going to have a heart attack, but it often is a precursor to it. Then we have tissue damage. Portions of your heart are actually dying. If enough of your heart dies, you're going to have heart failure. Now, in this case, it's important to realize that not only is it a physical damage to the, the heart itself, but because the physical damage is related to the myocardium, you're also going to have an electrical damage. So the myocardial layer being damaged affects the neural conduction, and so the heart no longer can pump properly with respect to an EKG, and eventually you'll die. Okay? So it's a big issue because heart failures, people who survive heart attacks, they have actually a weaker and weaker heart. That means they tr their heart has to work p harder to maintain the same blood pressure. Next slide. Next slide. Okay. Now the flow to the lungs. Same rule. So flow to the lungs. Okay. Now in the lungs, you want to look at it as an opposite thing. You have more oxygen the vessels will dilate. Low oxygen content, vessels will constrict. Okay. 
So that's your alveoli in your lungs. Okay, next slide. I really don't care too much about this one, so we can ignore that slide. And now we have this picture. Again, as you can see, who is on the top of the totem pole? The brain, right? Always on the top. And again, I always mention what? Left ventricle as my story because that's the key, key concept. You screw up the left ventricle, all of this will drop in terms of blood pressure and cardiac output. For the venous side, we have this one. Okay. All right. For the pulmonary circuit, as I mentioned when I first started, this chapter and the last chapter, I'm not too much concerned with the pulmonary circuit. Be aware of this slide and the next slide. So this slide and the last one, be aware of. And it's true for this one as well. Okay, next. This is a picture version of that same story. The reason why I'm not concerned with the last three slides is because we'll see them again in greater detail in the lung chapter. Okay, here's the last slide before I go into the templates. Systemic circuit contains 85% of my blood volume. Okay, 85% of the blood volume. And that's your A, A, C, V, V. Okay, so A, 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 or A, A, C, V, V. And that already is included in all this. I don't care for that one. Okay, now we're going to start with our templates. Now on page 739, you're going to see a picture that looks like this. Okay, so page 739. What you're going to need to do is can you relate this picture to the torsos on the lab day? So you're, you need to be able to take this picture and the bottom picture and be able to relate it to the torso. Now starting on page 741, which you see this picture and the next one, this picture and that, these two pictures, they're related to the templates that go with the models. So during lab day, you're going to be able to take these arteries and put them into place. So you need to know where they are. So can you identify these blood vessels in the models in the lab room? Okay, so this slide applies. This slide applies. Okay, moving forward, the author continues by mentioning this one again. We have our arm. So the arm has it too. We have our neck on page 742. Repeat it again on page 742 with this slide. So the object of the game is can you identify these arteries? The next one that's important is this slide. Okay. And here in the middle you have a thing called cerebral arterial circle. It is often called the circle of Willis. So cerebral arterial circle, also called circle of Willis. Okay. Be able to pay, take these blood vessels and show them. We do have a brain model that goes with this. Next slide. We have this one. So we have our internal carotid shown here. We would have the external a little bit further down. The external actually is on the outside. It's the internal carotid that goes into and gets very close to the circle of Willis. I'll quickly show you that. So here's your internal carotid going into the brain. And you can see that again here. And here it is, internal carotid. And it is actually shown as a cut portion in this picture. So the external would be on the outside. It's only the internal carotid that actually goes into the brain. Okay, I will continue with my templates. The next one is this one on page 744. It continues with 
the rest of this picture as well. And then here's yet another. And each of these has a further one showing you the abdominal region. Okay. So the abdominal region. You have another flow chart that looks like this. Okay. Then moving forward on pages 640, sorry, 746 and 747. We have this one. We have the further lower portion of the leg, the hip again from the back view, and the leg again from the back view. And you're more than welcome to use the flow charts that you see next to the picture, for example, on page 747. And that takes care of the arteries. Now on page 749, the author goes into the veins. The same story will apply for the veins. So we have this picture, that picture. Then the author continues by having the neck. So they show the neck view of the veins. And then they have the brain. That's the sagittal view of the brain. And then the next one they have on page 750 is this one. Now, Nemesh, how am I going to make this work? When it comes to the neck, the brain pictures, create a flow chart. So you have arteries going into the brain, and then you have veins coming out of the brain. So, for example, I would start for the brain artery by saying the internal carotid. Find the arteries that it branches off into, and then once you're done with that, find the way back out by way of the venous system, the veins. And you'll see that it actually makes a full flow chart. Okay, continuing. We have the arm on page 751 along with the chest on page 751. We have another picture of it, and we have these templates to help you understand the flow chart. Notice the author has done much of what I've asked you to do, so you can actually use the one that's directly in the book. Even the ones I mentioned for the brain are actually shown here as well. So you can actually see the ones coming down. Okay? So that's an important line. So that's your venous. We'll continue the story with the leg. On the leg, the one that's definitely worthwhile keeping in mind is this very long one called the great saphenous vein. What is important about the great saphenous vein is that is the one that is often used as or bypass in hearts. So when they do a heart bypass surgery, they actually take a piece of this to reconstruct the vessels for the heart. And we have the backside view of the leg. We have the flow from the hip and the leg. So flow of the hip and the leg. And please use these flow charts. They're very well constructed. Then further down, we have the abdominal region. We have the abdominal region again. And yet we have another flow chart for it. Okay. Okay, that takes care of the key ones. Then the last thing we're going to end with and look at is the fetal circulation shown on this picture on page 756. Again, don't forget to look at this picture on page 756 along with this picture. And if you recall, there are certain things that are closed. The author here calls it ductus arteriosus. Well, if you remember, this is the one that turns into the ligamentum arteriosum. That's this thing right here. And then the foramen ovale becomes the fossa ovalis. So that's mentioned here as well. So the foramen ovale, which is later the fossa ovalis, and then the ductus arteriosus, which is later the 
ligamentum arteriosum. Okay. okay, and then on page 757, they talk about the different heart defects. So this is the normal heart, and then on that same page, they have other templates showing you what can go wrong with the heart. It is a very good idea for test purposes to understand them. Okay, so it is a good idea to understand them, page 757. Don't have to memorize them, don't have to know them in great detail, but understand what is going on when you see the name. So if you see the name, you should have an idea of what's going on. Okay, last few slides. Aging. Okay. What's going to happen when we age? We're going to have a problem with our heart, problem with our blood, and our blood vessels. Now, one of the themes I've mentioned is this, decreased hematocrit. So when you have changes in your blood when you get older, you're going to have a decreased hematocrit. More likely for blood clots. And because of pool, pooling in blood, because of a poor venous valve. So when you get your varicose veins and the venous valves are poor, you're going to start having pooling. And remember, pooling is never good. So pooling is always bad. Okay, continuing. Here's what happens in the heart. Decreased cardiac output. Your nervous system of the heart, so your electrical system of the heart starts going. Your blood vessels start clogging up. Okay. So you're going to have to work harder to get the same work done. Okay. Blood vessels. Blood, vi blood vessels, vessels become more likely to have an aneurysm because they become less elastic. So arteries become less elastic and you're likely to get an aneurysm. Calcium deposits are likely to clog up your blood vessels. So you'll either get a brain stroke or a heart attack because you're getting plaques building up. Okay, and now the last slide. Okay. So you can have a structural problem, a functional problem, one way or the other, it's a problem. Okay. All right, that ends chapter 21. Do not forget to go over the blood vessel templates while you are in the lab room. So go through those templates, and I'm speaking of things like page 752, those flow charts. Okay and pages like 750 for the veins of the brain and the neck, those are very likely to be asked. Okay? That ends chapter 21.